Hello, and welcome to the Dissident Mama podcast. Today, my guest is Pedro Gonzalez. He is the former assistant editor of American Greatness and now associate editor at Chronicles, a magazine of American culture. He has written all around. Uh, I will share his links in uh, the podcast uh, show notes, and he has also been on various uh, uh, other folks' podcasts. He also has some uh, content of his own. Uh, he creates uh, Contra. It is the home of his Contra newsletter, where you can also find his podcast discourses and his column, Super Contra. Uh, so uh, Pedro is going to win the nicest guy on the internet contest because uh, you all will see that uh, we have recorded an interview once before and my tech issues I sounded horrible, my audio did, but he sounded great. So I am going to uh, attempt to uh, interview him again with no tech issues, God willing. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and link to the original one. So you get some background on him. Uh, so if you like what he says today, you can listen to the original interview and hear what he has to say about his background and kind of came, how he came to be who he is. So uh, Pedro, uh, we're going to do current events today. Are you cool with that? Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Uh, so I have been at the Abbeville Institute Summer School uh, for the past week. And apparently all hell broke loose over the past week. So uh, tell us a little bit about what's been going on. First of all, um, the Georgia Guidestones, do you know anything about uh, what happened to them? Or uh, are there any theories as to why they came down, maybe give listeners a little primer, and if you think it's even a big deal at all. I'm, I'm not too familiar with them other than the fact that the Guidestones seem to be associated with population control stuff, but I, I don't know uh, a whole lot about their destruction or their even their origins, And but it seems to be like a symbolic thing, uh, something that like, people who kind of resent the ideas that are laid down there are celebrating about, but I have, I have not followed the story very care, uh, closely, no. I see it as uh, a win. I'm assuming it's a, a, a person who's very concerned with the global American empire or a uh, new world order type thing going out there and blowing it up. Uh, but there are some people, I've seen just a tiny bit of chatter of people saying, you know, how everybody takes something that seems good and makes it, you know, seem really horrible, but that it was going to like pave the way for taking down the Stone Mountain Confederate Monument in Georgia, or that it's just going to, um, I don't know, increase police or something like that. Do you see? No, think I about didn't. No, I, I, like I said, I've been following it very, very closely. Um, I've, I've kind of had my, my nose in this report that I've been writing on transgenderism, and that's actually kind of taken me away from from current events and I'm, I'm, I just finished that maybe a week ago so I'm, I'm kind of getting back into the the new cycle and uh, the 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 thing that has kind of caught my eyes is what's going on with immigration on the border that okay. it was basically a, a de facto amnesty policy by the Biden administration uh, but yeah no unfortunately I have been following the the, the guidestone story very closely okay. Uh, we'll get to the uh, immigration stuff and your transgender uh, essay. Is it something you've already released or you're still working on it? It's a kind of research project and it's in the review process right now. So okay. once it is finalized and all that, it'll be uh, published as a kind of as a, as a paper with a uh, with the American Principles Project. So I'm looking forward uh -huh. to that because it's it's a pretty long and thorough dive into transgenderism and its consequences. Excellent. Well, I definitely want to talk about that. So let me speed through the past week. What about, uh, did you hear about the Japanese former prime minister who was kind of like a Trump friend? Yeah. Shinzo Abe. Yeah. yeah. So say his name one more time. Shinzo Abe is how I've heard his last name, his surname pronounced. Um, I think that the, the interesting part of that assassination was the fact that a lot of people including myself, assumed that the killer would be a political extremist or maybe tiny, tied to the Chinese government or something like that. But from my understanding, he was kind of a 41-year-old deadbeat. And this is someone who had written his yearbook that he had no clue what he wanted to do with his life. And he was not politically active at all. I don't even think he had a criminal record. He was just someone 
who just had nothing in his life. And it struck me as another incident that is kind of consistent with what we see in the United States at Uvalde and also with the, the more recent shooting. Um, it, I think it was, it was in Ohio, wasn't it? The, I think the Chicago, more, the 4th of July one. Yeah, yeah was, it in, was it in Illinois? Yeah. I think so. In, in both of those cases, you had these shooters who were kind of emerged in these subcultures on the internet and everything we know about their lives tells us that they were essentially nihilists, that they were people that had given up on the possibility of finding meaning and I think resented other people for either attempting to find meaning in life or simply existing. I mean, deeply misanthropic people, right? And this, this killer in Japan kind of seems like he's cut from the same cloth. And this someone who really had nothing in his life but also not a kind of extremist or anything like that. Just someone who I think you would characterize as almost a nihilist himself. And Catherine D is a, a really talented writer and thinker. And she published an article uh, through my Substack called uh, Mass Shootings and the World Liberalism Made. And, and she actually takes a swing at this issue of basically that this is a kind of new breed of killer, this, this nihilist who has no real uh, political motive uh, and, and is almost acting out of a boredom or a resentment for the human race, you know, and I think you, again, you kind of see shadings of this in Japan, and it's just interesting that this is a kind of international phenomenon, uh, because, I mean, I think the guy was like a forklift oper operator or something like, something like that, like, and he was recently unemployed, and he just decided to make a shotgun out of like spare parts from Home Depot. I don't know if they have Home Depot in Japan, but I mean, you look at it, it was basically like two pipes and a bunch of duct tape and he assassinated Shinzo Abe. Just really bizarre. Yeah, so there's a couple of things that I think of when you talk about that. It's the identity-less people who maybe make good um, candidates for let's say, um, you know, uh, government officials who want to create chaos and, you know, make uh, right wingers seem crazy. Uh, you know, maybe they're being targeted because, again, I didn't follow the news over the past week that closely, but the 4th of July shooter in Chicago, he had said something about, um, hey, thanks, feds, or something yeah. to that effect, uh, you know, alluding to yeah. the fact that you know, flirting they, with this, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I mean, in the Buffalo, the, the Buffalo shooter, um, mm -hmm. had been in contact with a quote-unquote former, uh, a retired federal retired. agent. That's, that's, that's how the media, there's a, a local news uh, outlet in Buffalo that talked about this, about how the FBI has acknowledged an investigation into contacts that the Buffalo shooter had, one of which was referred to as a retired federal agent. So I, I think that we don't know, right? right? We don't know what exactly is going on, but I think that the fact that people are so prone to just accepting that their own government wants to kill them and would do things like this to them. I mean, whether or not that is actually true, what I mean by true is, is of course, like worst case scenario, you're talking about something like MK Ultra, whatever. Right. Whether or not that is or is not the case, we have no idea. It's one of these things that's impossible to prove, right? But I think the, the more important the more important point is that it, it indicates that Americans have pretty much lost faith in their government. This is, a, I think that this is maybe almost more alarming than the, the MK Ultra stuff. The fact that so many people just accept or just kind of suspect that, uh, that's, that's extremely unhealthy that you have a society where a massive part of the population thinks my government is trying to kill me. I mean, I think we don't really we don't really pause and think about that, right? Like that's not normal. It's not normal for millions of Americans to just think like, yeah, my this is yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised if the government was behind this because they want to kill me. It's like that's that's not normal, and it's also not sustainable. Like that kind of a society is is going to run out of gas uh, sooner than later. 
Exactly. And we had talked in uh, the first interview about how you classify yourself as a nationalist. Uh, really, would it require a strong man to come in to our federal republic and uh, just be the leader to kind of put it all back together, this mess? How, how would you see uh, the, the repairing of putting faith back in the government? I mean, would it have to kind of be dismantled first or does a strong man come in and kind of clean house? Well, I think when you get into these, these arguments of basically, do we try to keep this thing together and fix it as a whole or kind of spin it apart, the argument uh, essentially between, I guess you could see decentralization or decentralization, which does not necessarily entail secessionism or outright secessionism, which does in fact entail a kind of crack up of the United States or the opposite, basically trying to fix this through a kind of nationalist platform. Uh, I don't know if we talked about this before, but I, I said that I think the work is kind of the same and that, I mean, even if you wanted to kind of disempower um, the establishment or the regime, whatever you want to call it, you would actually kind of need, in either case, a, a kind of energetic executive to use a frame used by Hamilton in the Federalist Papers. You would need an executive, in other words, who's willing to use power to undermine the power of the political establishment. And I think one of the one of the most obvious examples of this that that conservatives, inc including let's call them decentralizers, are familiar with, although they might not be aware of it, is uh, talking about getting rid of the Department of Education. Even if you wanted to do that, that would take some pretty serious leadership, right? That would take some some really assertive and aggressive style of leadership to get that done. So in either case, you need power, uh, even if your ultimate goal is to shrink this thing. So I think that, that the predicament that we're in is that this thing that we're up against, which is not constrained by the constitution that a lot of Americans are still fond of and, and still think and would like to believe is in operation, uh, it's not constrained by that. And that forces a crisis where you, you actually need this kind of leadership uh, because someone who's hemmed in by the rules, the rules that no one in it plays by, uh, they're, they're just setting themselves up for failure. And I think maybe this was a, a, something that Trump encountered because although Trump was portrayed in the media as a kind of energetic leader himself who was domineering and was going to reshape the government, he actually was pretty mild in, in terms of his leadership style and and his, his flaw was that I think he tried to actually always, or more often than not, kind of operate within, uh, within the constitutional framework for which conservatives praised him. Uh, but you can see that apart from the Supreme Court, I mean, what about the Trump administration can we still point to today and say that's, he did that, he got that done. You know, there's not a whole lot, uh, so I think, just the question itself, I mean, what kind of leader do we need? Do we need this like Hamiltonian executive? I think yes, but there are other, there are other things that we need. Um, but to the people that would kind of clutch their pearls at that, like, wow, that's, that's a scary thought. I think it's important to remember that uh, those of us who would prefer that kind of style of leadership, we're not the ones that created this mess. Uh -huh. It was, it was the people that <clears throat> decided to shred the norms and, and, the, the constitutional order, uh, they, they in, in this kind of dialectical way, they have led to this point, so. Yeah, I agree 100%. So I, I've told you before, I'm a secessionist, a decentralist, a Jeffersonian. Uh, but when Trump came around, you know, I was like, well, we live in a Lincolnian world, you know, Lincoln invaded sovereign states. He um, threw his political enemies in jail. He shut down newspapers. I was like, well, maybe Trump needs to do some of that. You know, that's kind of what I wanted because I'm like, this is the world we're living in, this Lincolnian nation state. So, you know, we may as well start playing by those rules. I don't love those rules. I didn't invent them, but it kind of is what it is. And in fact, um, I think everything you said is uh, so uh, 
so right on. So I was at the Abbeville Institute con uh, Conference or summer school. For those of you who don't know, I'm sure most of my listeners do, but a very Jeffersonian Southern tradition uh, institute. But there were some speakers there that talked about how possibly we need a strong man to kind of put the genie back in the bottle, but filtered through the Southern tradition. So he would be more Jeffersonian than Hamiltonian in theory, right? But uh, they, some people still see the need for it. So I find that uh, fascinating that people are talking about these things in just uh, regular conversation that maybe yeah. just two or three years ago would not be speaking in these terms. Well, there's that saying, right? Uh, Jeffersonian ends by Hamiltonian means. Uh, and you can say that that's a kind of contradiction in terms, but I mean, the, the, the point of this is that Jefferson's rhetoric was always Jefferson's rhetoric was not really consistent with how he governed as a president, that as a president, he was a bit more Hamiltonian, not because he was a hypocrite or anything, but just the, the exigencies of being the president of the United States forced him to be more Hamiltonian than, than we remember through his rhetoric and things like that. So, but, but the point of it was that, that you have to, sometimes you have to be that way, uh, even if your ultimate goal is to be Jeffersonian, and I mean, even famous uh, well, uh, thinkers like Sam Francis, Samuel T. Francis, who used to write for Chronicles, uh, this, this is a point that he would always stress was that on the one hand, we didn't create this mess. We did not force this crisis that brought us to this point and made leaders like Trump uh, so appealing on the national level and DeSantis so appealing on the state level because DeSantis is doing on the state level what Trump Libs thought was doing on the national level, although he didn't actually do that. But DeSantis actually is. I think like you look at the Florida, uh, the the parent parental rights and education law and stuff like that. Like this is the kind of stuff that we would like to have seen Trump do on the national level. But uh, the point is, or the point that St. Francis would make that is that even if you wanted to get like to the to the agrarian Republican paradise, you know, that, that Southerners pine for, and, and St. Francis was himself a Southerner, you would actually need to take a kind of Hamiltonian path to get there because only power can check power. Yep. Uh, and, and that is the kind of problem that we're up against today. And, and I think it's important to remember that although St. Francis is remembered as a, as a kind of populist and a nationalist, I think at heart, he was a, a kind of Republican, like a classical Republican. He was someone who wanted limited government in, in the true sense, like that just kind of leaves a virtuous citizenry to live, you know, live free lives. But he understood that, that it was impossible to get to that point unless we had a different kind of leadership, basically like a right-wing FDR or something, right. uh, or, or like a right-wing Huey Long, you know, who was, who was willing to, to do that stuff. Yeah, uh, because, you know, the Southern tradition would be very much uh, live and let live. You know, you do your thing over there. We just want to be left alone. But, uh, if anybody from 2020 onward thinks anybody wants to be, um, anybody is willing to leave people alone who has any type of institutional authority or power, uh, I mean, that's just not a thing, you know? Yeah. And I think the past two years has woken a lot of people up, which goes back to your, you know, the, the loss of faith in government. So there's a lot of black pilling going on. And this can maybe segue into my next thing. So Boris Johnson, well, the black pill can lead to the white pill. So we'll get to that. But Boris Johnson is retiring in, uh, as prime minister of Great Britain. And uh, you have some camps saying, this is the white pill. It's because the, the elites are on the run. You know, they see that the, 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 the emperor, everybody sees that the emperor has no clothes and they're starting to get scared. I'm not sure I buy that, but what are your takes on that as far as, um, you know, populism uprising? And then maybe you can weave into that something about the dark Dutch farmers and what seems pretty much like yeah. a revolution going <clears throat> on. I'm not sure how Johnson's resignation factors into this, this broader narrative of the the end of the liberal world order mm -hmm. but i think i mean there there does seem to be writing in the wall that spells that out to a degree i mean if you talk about the dutch farmers which is obviously very reminiscent of the trucker protests that went down in canada and briefly in the united states but yeah i mean 
there, there's actually an article today in the Associated Press that it, its thesis is, is exactly this, that there's, there's a kind of crisis in Western liberal democracies where, of course, it's the AP, so it's, it's biased in the sense that they're framing it as uh, choose your own reality. The, the people in Western liberal democracies are giving up not only on democracy, but on reality. And the, as examples, they, they cite these bumpkins who think that, you know, COVID was not, that basically the, the whole ordeal of COVID was not as advertised, that there was, that, you know, like we never really found out where did this thing come from? Did it leak from a lab? Were the lockdowns actually necessary? Are things like, are the vaccines actually a good idea? Things like that. Like, that because they're questioning these things, they've abandoned reality instead of, of course, trusting the science and the experts. Um, or the, the, they also use the example of people who are questioning the, the consensus on Ukraine. You know, is Ukraine, in fact, a fight for democracy? And there are people, believe it or not, who don't actually think that Ukraine is all about democracy and that our involvement is, is perhaps um, a little bit more complicated than that. And so the AP uses this framing um, and, and shows that this is happening all over the West, not just in the, in the United States, but in, in Western liberal democracies, people are questioning uh, the consensus on all of these, on these issues and, and more. And that is taken as a kind of people are giving up on truth. And it's not, it's people have lost faith in liberal elites and in the order that they represent. And at the heart of this is, is that millions of people no longer think, millions of normal people no longer think that this order has uh, their best interests at heart. And I think the, uh, the reaction from world leaders to, including the UN actually, to the overturning of Roe v. Wade is really illustrative of this, right? Because we're all told that the liberal world order is based upon shared values that that is the thing that ties Western liberal democracies together, shared values. Now, those values are never really defined. We, we only tend to hear about them, I mean, apart from like the really obvious ones like BLM and like the LGBT pride stuff, but we only really hear about them uh, when people who the libs don't like do things that make them angry. You know, like trucker protests are a threat to democracy, according to Justin Trudeau. Um, but I, I guess my, my point is that, that you're going to see this intensify. I think regardless of, of how individual characters like Boris Johnson fit into this, this is the kind of cracking up, I hope, of, of, the, of the liberal world order. Now, there's obviously a downside to this is that it is an order, right? It, it's a rotten order, but it is an order. So that means that any kind of cracking up of it will probably result in a, in a time of like uncertainty and chaos and mm -hmm. things will get uglier, I think. But on the other hand, it's like, you this can't continue, right? I mean, an order that tells you that men can simply become women and that uh, younger and younger children can, can mutilate their bodies without parental consent and that we have to wage these like endless wars for democracy to the point where we're, we're openly talking about uh, I mean, this is an article, this is my final point. I'm sorry, I'm going on and on. Yeah, keep going. There's, there's an article by Matthew Kronig in Foreign Policy where he says that the United States has to prepare to, to defeat both Russia and China. And over, it's, it's a kind of a roundabout way of saying we need to be ready for a war against Russia and China. And he says, we, we have to be ready to defeat Russia and China and two different fronts in overlapping time frames. So, yeah, I mean, that's, like I said, it's a beat around the bush way of saying we need to go to war with both these countries at the same time. And, and in both cases, he says that we need, we need to be prepared to use nuclear weapons uh, against both, either to threaten them or to actually execute tactical nuclear strikes against both countries. These people are insane. Yeah. And I mean, and, and Kronig is, who I've, I met once, uh, he is a, he is a dyed in the wool liberal internationalist. Like he's like, no, that yeah, this is actually just the price for democracy. Right. Nuclear war with two other superpowers. Right, because democracy is working so great here. And it's interesting because uh, the domestic home front has become so insane culturally, economically, that uh, 
you know, people maybe 10 years ago that would be willing to like, yeah, you know, we just got to deal with these crises here at home because, you know, yay, America. I don't think many people are saying that. I mean, I'm shocked to find the, you know, super, you know, flag wearing, you know, classic patriot type people, you know, just saying, uh, uh, you know, not when we have five dollar uh, gasoline, or yeah. not when interest rates are crazy, or you can't buy a home or building supplies, whatever it happens to be, um, you know, shelves empty and all that kind of thing. Uh, you, you know, uh, is is that going to work? And um, the populist uprising um, is it going to benefit that, or is that just going to be? as far as the crises at home, just another way to keep us at bay because we're all like, you know, trying to barter for food or whatever it comes to. Do you think it's going to work in our benefit or is it going to inspire more uprising? I think it, it, it depends. Um, I think that the one thing that you can say about the way things are now is, is that it's very good at kind of jujitsuing people's energies into pointless causes. And this is why as bad as the Democratic Party is, and as, and as you know, bad as Biden is, I'm wary of the the red wave that's coming because what is the GOP going to do with that red wave? You know, like it seems like every day I hear some prominent Republicans say that Biden has not done enough to help Ukraine. We're we we are currently in excess of 55 billion dollars uh, committed to Ukraine over the period of like what six or seven months. Right. That's in, that is totally. Unprecedented. I don't know that we've like this dwarfs what we did with uh, Iraq and Afghanistan in, in the same time periods. Like, it, I, I'm I'm pretty sure. I mean, this is unprecedented. Uh, the amount of money that we're giving to Ukraine, the lack of oversight, and the speed at which we we're giving it, it, it's hard to think of another contemporary example of this. And no one's asking why. I mean, like Iraq. Obviously, I'm I'm. Uh, I'm one, of, I'm one of the people that thinks Iraq was a, like a, a disaster, um, but you could make a case for Iraq, although it's obviously not correct, that there was a kind of national interest. I, I don't know, like, you know, so, like you could make a, the argument that Saddam supported terrorism or something and that affected us. And as, you know, like I said, although I don't think that's correct, there, there's a, there's a, it's easier to make that argument with Iraq. With Ukraine, what is the argument for our involvement in Ukraine, uh, to the point where we're talking about, you know, using nukes and things like that, uh, it it makes less sense, is what I'm saying, right. than than our, the arguments for going to Iraq, which already didn't make sense. Uh, but I mean, even guys like Glenn Greenwald have said that the the war fervor right now is worse than than he thinks it was uh, during the Iraq War era. It's just it's totally insane. Uh, and Republicans are saying that Biden isn't doing enough, right. you know, and and uh, and you've got other Republicans who are basically running. I mean, like uh, Myra Flores, who I'm I'm kind of hopeful that she's going to snap out of it and and stop listening to the people around her in Texas that are encouraging her to do this. But but Myra Flores had this kind of historic victory for Republicans in, in Texas. She won an area that Republicans I think haven't won in in a long time. And it, it's like a largely Hispanic area that's near the border. And so of course they celebrated a victory, uh, but then Myra Flores turned around and started talking about amnesty for a uh, uh, restricted amnesty. But the, the point is, is that no amnesty is ever really restricted. Um, and again, it, it's just, it's, I'm wary about it because the red wave doesn't actually look so great. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think that the um, the instability is you probably can't contain it. I think that the the instability of like the like I said the liberal world order is only going to get worse. But I think that ele electoral politics and specifically the G GOP will do what it can to kind of stabilize things. Um, but on the other hand, I've never seen the grassroots so active and militant and unsatisfied with the national let's call it the establishment GOP, which is a sign of health. Well, this dovetails into my next question. So June kind of became, instead of Pride Month, it became Life Month. You know, you had talked about the overturning of Roe, and it was one of those things that, you know, uh, Republicans ran on life for whatever, 
73 to whatever it was, you know, over 40 years. Yeah. Uh, yes, there were some very uh, sincere people in that group, but a lot of them liked the status quo because it got them votes. Um, yes. The times that they would be in power, executive and legislative, they did jack, uh, you know. Yeah. So I don't have too much hope for, you know, the red wave being run by, uh, you know, elites at the top. Uh, so I'm hoping, you know, people at the local and state level, and of course, just normal people will uh, keep it from becoming, you know, whatever the Tea Party became. So uh, do, do you have any two cents on Roe? And were you shocked? I was, I was taken aback. I had no idea this was going to occur. Yeah, it, no, it, was, a, it was a total black swan event. And I, I, at some point, I think I want to write about this because it was a black swan event, or some people think it was an act of providence. But what I, what I mean by Black Swan event is that a lot of things had to happen for, for that, for Roe to be overturned. Number one was Donald Trump being elected. Number two was the vacancies on the court. Number three was these judges actually getting approved. And four was them act, you know, actually pulling the trigger on it. So it, there's a lot of variables in this decision. And I'm, I'm saying that because to your point, the idea that this was, you know, the plan all along, this was, this was always Mitch McConnell's plan. You know, this was what National Review was pushing for. I'm saying that because National Review, uh, they, they fundraised on the decision on Roe. Uh, they had a, a banner on their website telling people that at last, you know, Roe has been overturned. Please support our mission and we'll double your donation today. And all I could think about was that issue that National Review ran called Against Trump. If National Review would have gotten its way, Trump would not have been elected, and thus Roe would not have been overturned. And, and they have the audacity to, to fundraise on it. And I think that's actually really illustrative of how the GOP works, right? They, they take credit for the victories of other people. And, the, and the, obviously, the, the establishment GOP hated Trump. Uh, I think you can argue, I think you can quibble over the, to the degree to which, in the end, Trump's policies really differed from the establishment. But regardless, like they, they, they resent him, right? Uh, or at least they resented him certainly more when he was when he was running and he he posed the possibility of really uprooting the the geo the what the GOP represents. Uh, so I think that 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 is in really important distress. Like this was a completely unforeseen event. It was a black swan event. Uh, let, let's let's not give the wrong people credit here. Yeah. So obviously the, the people that actually made that decision on the court deserve credit because it came at literal physical risk to themselves uh, today, right? I mean, someone was just arrested recently for planning to assassinate Brett Kavanaugh. Um, but I think that the thing that tells you that the GOP was not expecting this to happen was how uncomfortable they got when Clarence Thomas said, this is just the beginning. We're coming for other things next, like do, uh, like uh, same-sex marriage. And immediately, like Lindsey Graham and other key GOP figures were like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's, okay, a row is good enough. Let's let's stop there. Let's take the W on row, but we don't need to, to go any further and, and basically revisit all of these decisions that fall under the same principle, uh, I think that the due process thing, right? The 14th Amendment that we don't need to that we just need to stop there. It is, but it actually makes no logical sense to stop there, right? Like this invented right to abortion that kind of became a top-down law for the entire country. Okay, that was that was fine, and we overturned that. But all the other ones, no, we don't we don't need to revisit those. Why not? Right. And I think you can see that like it you it almost makes you wonder if Clarence Thomas was saying that to kind of call people's bluff. Um, and I think the fact that the GOP is extremely the, the again, I, I have to keep stressing this, the national GOP represented by people like Graham and McCarthy and McConnell, like leadership, uh, these key figures, how uncomfortable they are with the prospect of, of, an, of a genuinely socially conservative agenda, right? That, that is not just something to fundraise on, but something to actually act upon. And on the state level, you see this happening. Uh, across the United States, there are hundreds of bills that are designed specifically to prevent the proliferation of, of transgenderism. Um, but again, this is happening like on the state level. It's it's mostly happening among Republicans that you've never heard of because they're not on Fox News. They're not like Lindsey Graham. They're not like McConnell or McCarthy, you know, or Dan Crenshaw or whatever. 
uh, there are people that are Republicans on the state level working quietly to actually advance a socially conservative agenda that I think makes the national GOP really uncomfortable. Right. And of course, there are negative folks out there that want to turn this beautiful, you know, aligning of the stars uh, into something bad that, oh, this is the one W so they can, you know, like, you know, kind of throwing that out there so they can crack down on other things or keep doing their totalitarianism in other spheres. And I just don't see that at all because yeah. I see it as kind of the blending of what we were talking about earlier. So Clarence Thomas is kind of the strong man, right? He's the person who has the cojones and is doing these things at risk to his reputation and life, et cetera, et cetera. But it's very decentralist too, because it's just yeah. sending abortion yeah. back to the states where it should have been since 1973. So I saw it as just, I, I was extremely pleased. <laughs> yeah. No, I think I think people have reason to to celebrate, obviously, over this. I, I don't. I think the there 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 are two things that are true, and that is that certainly some people will use this as a distraction. Like, okay, now you can't criticize McConnell because this was always McConnell 40 chess. Right. And if you criticize McConnell, then you're just dumb. Like that's, I mean, that's, I've, I've kind of seen this and I don't, I, obviously I think that's totally incorrect. Um, is that I David also, French's take? Like, is that, that, is that David French's take? Is I'm that not sure. Of- I mean, it, it's probably, the funny thing is, is that you're probably going to hear that the most from people like French, mm-hmm. you know, pe- in other words, people that did nothing to get us to this point. Yes. They're going to be the ones that are going to say, that Clarence Thomas's victory is proof that I was right, and therefore you can't criticize me and the establishment GOP. Right. This was always part of the plan. Um, so I think I think that's certainly true. I don't. I don't but I, what I'm saying is I don't think that it was like a, a nefarious plot to, right. to do that or anything like that. I think it, like again, it, really no one saw this coming. But um, I it, honestly, the thing about Roe that I think is most significant is the fact that th- there will still be abortions in the United States. Roe has actually not banned abortion it's just like you said send it back to the states but the reaction from the left which is just like completely uh, apocalyptic it, it really shows that for them on the one hand they know that much of their agenda has been imposed in a really top-down fashion and it, therefore it's really fragile yeah. it just takes one ruling from the supreme court to overturn something like this right that's actually it shows you again it's it's quite fragile if you can kind of set up the ambush correctly and on the other hand that a lot of these things are symbolic abortion really seems to be a kind of religious icon for like a, a talisman for the left in much the same way that things like transgender children are and protected groups like illegal aliens are like all of these things seem to have symbolic and religious significance for the left well that's a perfect way to stop it right here uh Pedro is being wonderful and letting me piece together two Zoom interviews. So we have less than a minute left. Uh, We're going to continue with the transgenderism, transgenderism, immigration. And then I think I want to ask you a little bit about Hunter Biden uh, in our last 20 minutes. So I'll see you in a second, Pedro. Thank you. Okay, so we kind of ended up uh, ended off talking about uh, immigration and transgenderism. So tell us about some of the work you have been doing with the transgenderism. Yeah, so I wrote a report that I hope will be published soon that's kind of like a general theory of transgenderism. And a lot of books have been published on the subject, especially recently. Uh, But I, I tried to do a kind of comprehensive critique in under 10,000 words. Uh, so not book length, but obviously longer than an op-ed or something like that. And I mean, really the, the conclusion that I'm, I'm trying to get people to come away with is that every aspect of this is bad. And I'm, I'm saying that because there are still a lot of people who are, who are convinced that, um, convinced that basically transgenderism for like 16 year olds is bad. Uh, but if we just increase the the age for for transition therapy to like 18, it's fine. Or that you know, uh, for for people like Bruce Jenner, it's totally normal. Caitlyn Bruce Jenner. I don't know if you're uh, wherever you upload this is going to get kicked off the internet for saying that. But I mean, the, the the fact that that is actually something that you have to be concerned about. You know, like dead naming someone uh, could get you kicked off the internet. I mean, that should tell you there's something deeply wrong about this. 
Uh, but but a lot of people, especially conservatives in particular, because I mean, this is ultimately written for a conservative audience, uh, don't seem to understand that like every aspect of this um, is is bad and it serves no social good. And accepting one part of it, the idea that, okay, well, this adult Republican who ran for governor in California, uh, that person's fine for some reason, but we have to stop it from affecting children or something like that. Uh, no, like from, from top to bottom, the ideology of transgenderism is insanely dangerous and harmful and it's, it's spreading, uh, it's spreading rapidly. And I think that this is what I was getting at earlier with uh, the, the state level that you're seeing Republicans on the state level, these, these kind of faceless members of, of the state GOP actually trying to put legislation together to, to kind of stem the tide of this stuff because they're probably dealing with it firsthand you know, like in their own communities, their own families and things like that. And they see how dangerous this stuff is. And uh, one of the things that I do is I try to kind of give people a starting point. Like what is an example of patient zero? Like when did we really kind of start going down this path specifically with, with in regard to children? And so I cover in brief the story of David Reamer. David Reamer was a little boy who uh, his, his penis was severely damaged in a botched circumcision in the 60s. And his parents had heard about this doctor named John Money. And Money had made his reputation as a researcher into intersex conditions. And specifically, he, he had worked a lot with like hermaphrodites. And his parents had heard about Money's uh, work, mostly through his media stuff, because Money was actually... Other scholars have pointed this out that money did not rise to prominence um, through his his clinical work. It was through his presence in the media and his his shrewd use of the media to spread his ideas. Like that's that's how his that's how he gained some attraction. And so his parents had heard about uh, Doctor Money through the media, and so they went to him and they told him, you know, like our little boy uh, was you know, th this happened to our little boy and, and can you please help us? Like basically the, the parents were open to the possibility of having their little boy raised as a girl. And, uh, but that's not to say that they were like really eager about it. They, they were just, they just realized that he would probably never have like a normal life as a male because of what happened. And so they were just kind of desperate and confused right. and money saw an opportunity to do something that he had always wanted to do. Um, but he said it would it would be unethical to 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 kind of create this scenario in a controlled environment. He's actually he said something to that effect that it would be unethical to perform an experiment like, experiment like this in a laboratory. But the 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 way that he rationalized doing this was that it was kind of an accident of nature that this had happened and that it had plopped into his lap. And so he actually kind of badgered the family to uh, to allow him to basically transition his son transition their son in, into a girl. And so at the age of 22 months, uh, this, they completely removed uh, Reamer's penis. They reconstructed a rudimentary like female genitals out of it. And he took the name uh, Brenda because he was actually born Bruce Reamer, uh, but they changed it to Brenda. And then later on when he realized he was a girl because for the first I think, 15 years of his life, he had no idea that he had been born a boy. And he, uh, and so when he found out, he, he took the name David. Um, but that was part of the experiment was the family was not allowed to let Brenda know that Brenda was born as a boy and that Brenda was part of this radical experiment. And I mean, it, it gets so much worse. Like money, money pioneered a lot of the really depraved ideas about sex and gender that are totally mainstream now. Like, for example, money thought it was important for children to interact with like sexual concepts as part of the, their development. And so he would have, uh, I think I have the book on my desk somewhere, um, but he, um, it's really good. I think, uh, I think it was, I, I can't, the, the, there it is, it's, it's right in front of me. I, I can't get it because it's actually holding up my camera, but it's called As Nature Made Him, The Boy Who Was Raised as a Girl by John Colapinto. The book is really good, but it's also really disturbing. And as part of teaching uh, Brenda to become a girl, uh, the journalist Cola Pinto recounts these interviews that he, that he had with the brothers where they, they told him that 
uh, Dr. Money would have them perform, like simulate sexual acts on each other. And so like, like Brenda would be on a couch on his knees while his brother, John Money would, in, the doctor would instruct the brother to go up behind him and like, you know, pretend that they were copulating and do, wow. and like, and uh, Brian, what the, the other brother said that on at least one occasion, Money photographed him doing this. And he said it was all part of his research. Uh, like, re, I mean, this is just the the surface level of this stuff. Like the, the book details it in, in brutal detail. And I, I recap, uh, basically the worst parts of it, because I think that's what people need to see. Like they need to see actually how depraved this stuff is and how the, the experts, right? The people that were supposed to, the people who gave us the science that we're supposed to trust, like how depraved these people are. Um, but the story gets really sad. Uh, Reamer's mother felt was, was riddled with guilt for what she did uh, because obviously uh, David Reamer never really never really adjusted. Uh, he, even though he didn't know he was born a boy, he never really accepted being a girl. He actually was, the, the family said that he was like the dominant one. As So as a little girl, he was like, uh, like the alpha of the two brothers. And he just always told his parents that there's something wrong with me. Like, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm a girl. And the parents would just have to lie to him. And, and I mean, this had all kinds of effects. Like basically he, he, he did poorly in school. Uh, he had behavioral issues. Um, like his his development was stunted, and as a result, his his mom actually attempted suicide. Um, his brother Brian actually did commit suicide later in life. He overdosed on antidepressants, and David Reamer himself blew his head off with a sawed-off shotgun. After he had gotten married and adopted kids and tried to live a normal life, uh, I mean, there were other things that were going on in his life. There was other stuff, but I'm, it you can't argue that this was the driving cause of, of his lifelong issues and his depression that ultimately contributed to him committing suicide. And this whole thing has been totally memory hole. And a lot of the language that we use today, like money coined terms like gender identity, money was, he claimed credit for the terminological switch from referring to things as pedophilia, as sexual deviance or sexual perversion which indicate that there's something path, like there's something wrong, right? Deviance to perversion, those things, that language tells you there's something wrong here. Money claimed credit for switching those things away from deviance perversion to paraphilia. Para uh, meaning abnormal, philia meaning love. So it goes, I mean, th this is a, an important switch. So pedophilia goes from being a perversion, uh, a deviance to being, there's a, there's something, you know, like you're, uh, you're, you have an abnormal attraction to children, which just that you've already kind of shifted the, the implications of what is actually going on here. Like you want to have sex with little kids, which is now no longer considered a deviance or perversion. It's kind of considered an abnormality, something that's unusual, but not necessarily pathological. Money was, was responsible for a lot of this stuff. And people have no idea. A lot of people are actually aware of the, the story of the Reamer brothers now because, because of the transgenderism. But uh, a lot of people are not aware of the influence that money had on language and, and how significant that is. Um, uh, because again, we, like, we use terms like gender identity without realizing that John Money was the guy that actually coined these terms as part of his project of separating biology um, from, from gender. So, Well, I would be one of those people. I've done um, a ton of research on transgenderism, I've written some essays, talked with some people. So I know more than the average bear. And I knew a bit of what you were saying, but there was a ton of stuff you said that I didn't know. And the language thing I do think is very, very important. Uh, is this going to be like an ebook or just a series of essays or one giant essay? No, it's going to be one big report. Um, it's 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 kind of, it's a cool project because I was basically asked to write like a I guess you, it's technically like a white paper, mm -hmm. but I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I've never written a white paper before. So I kind of was just like, okay, I'll do this uh, as long as I get a, like, you know, some, so an understanding that I'm, I'm going to do it in my way. And so I, it's almost written like, um, it's almost written as a kind of pamphlet. Uh, it, it's just my short kind of narrative form critique of transgenderism. And I, and I start with money, but then I also go on to like the, the um, 
the the money aspect of it, literally, uh, the, the amount of money that's involved in, uh, in the corporations that lobby to kind of push and promote uh, the drugs that are used specifically uh, with transitioning children, uh, the nonprofits that are kind of driving political change in this direction, uh, key figures, uh, the, the politicians who are receiving money from, from PACs that are affiliated with gender clinics and stuff like that. So it's really a kind of comprehensive critique and at the very end, I talk a little bit about uh, Michel Foucault. Uh, I'm not a Foucault scholar, uh, but, but Foucault is obviously associated with, with postmodernism, uh, also with queer theory. And I, I think Foucault was himself a deviant and a pedophile. And he famously signed this, uh, this uh, petition to abolish age of consent laws in France. So, I mean, Foucault is not a good guy. Uh, but he's nevertheless insightful. And, and basically he devised this kind of critique of, uh, of authority. And basically Foucault viewed schools and um, I think someone is either doing lighting off fireworks. I don't know if you can hear it. There's like gunshots outside of my window or fireworks, I don't know. Um, but Foucault developed this, this, this critique of- Sounds fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this critique of authority. And basically, he viewed like hospitals and schools and, and military barracks, place institutions that inculcate discipline, and and kind of develop the the modes by which we're supposed to live. That these are kind of like that these institutions are part of this big repressive machine, right? And and obviously the the project of Foucault's disciples is to kind of dismantle this stuff, dismantle all things that impose constraints on us, on, on our individual autonomy, um, basically eliminating all sources of authority. And the point that I make is, is that Foucault is actually right about like how institutions work. Um, and and, and he's, he's more or less correct about uh, the order of things. But the point that I make is, is that the, the people who kind of um, ascribe to this view of the world, whether or not they actually have read Foucault. I mean, a, a lot. It's, it's kind of like Marx. A lot of people imbibe Foucault or Marx without actually reading him just because he's everywhere. They didn't actually dismantle uh, hierarchies. They didn't dismantle these so-called repressive institutions. They just took them over and they're using them to inculcate a new order. Uh, they're, they're, in other words, the authority has not gone away the authority, the, the whip has just kind of changed hands. And whereas at least older systems of authority and hierarchy did, you could argue, serve something like a social good, like maybe actually constraints on some sexual behavior are actually good, like incest and pedophilia and things like that. Maybe those, maybe those constraints are there for a reason. Uh, that this new order that these people are, are, are building is actually depraved and serves nothing that even remotely resembles a social good. Yeah, so it turns out they just want power, right? You know, and they're using all this. Uh, I mean, from what I know about Foucault, yeah, he's extremely high IQ, smart person, but just wanted to take over the reins of power. I think that uh, is a, a, a very much a rubber stamp kind of thing that, that you see in non-right politics that, uh, you know, we, we started off this conversation talking about the strong man, where if it was through maybe a Christian lens or some type of old order uh, populist lens, it could perhaps uh, fix all the crises that are besetting us. But um, I mean, I just don't, who knows if that would work, but left-wingers don't see it that way. I mean, I think it's almost always about money and power with them and just, um, and diddling kids. <laughs> that seems to be their MO. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. So um, do you have uh, time for one more question and we can talk yeah. about the immigration stuff you've been working on and then we'll leave Hunter Biden for another day who wants to talk about him anyway. So tell us about uh, what you've been working on with immigration. Well, it's, it's more of just, I've just kind of taken an interest in getting back to work in this because it, it's an issue that no matter what is going on in the world, no matter how crazy things are, like what's going on with the Supreme Court or in Ukraine, the problem on the border is not going away. And so at the same time that we're discussing all of these things in current events, there's just a continuous stream of people entering the country illegally. And I mean, it's really 
crazy to think about it like that. Like every single day, there are people entering the country illegally. And the Biden administration is, is implementing these policies that amount to de facto amnesty. Uh, like DHS is allowing people uh, that are in the country on these kind of like, um, they're, they're, they're supposed to be here temporarily, like waiting for deportation, but like the, the, the requirements uh, and, and the protocols that are supposed to result in these people being de eventually deported are kind of being silently removed. Uh, and when you do that, it's like, I mean, that's, it's, that's amnesty without passing any laws. Um, and I, I don't know, it, it's just, what is the solution for this, right? I'm not sure. And I think it, it kind of gets back to this problem of how the right and left approach issues. And when you look at the people who Biden put in charge of DHS, Mallorcas, versus who Trump put in charge of DHS, ultimately Chad Wolf. It's like these are two entirely different creatures. Chad Wolf, people forget this, Chad Wolf was actually an immigration lobbyist for a trade group of Indian uh, companies. And so before he worked as the head of uh, DHS, he was a, like I said, a, his job was actually to increase the amount of, uh, of visas, uh, to get more visas for, for mostly Indian workers to get into the United States. And then somehow this guy becomes the head of DHS. And I, again, people have forgotten about this, but remember Tucker Carlson was blasting this guy for, for using his power at DHS briefly to attempt to increase the number of legal immigrants that were able to get into the United States, specifically people that end up taking jobs from like from white collar workers, or in other words, people that are, you know, that make up a good part of the middle class. Biden, on the other hand, brings in Mayorkas, who's a, like the guy's a killer. Uh, he's a complete, he's an ideologue, like he's committed to the mission. He's super smart uh, and he's dangerous. And I mean, look at the difference in outcomes here. I, I think there's basically, there's a lesson to be learned here uh, with how the Biden administration is handling immigration versus how the Trump administration did it. I mean, we, we didn't get the wall. We did not get the end of birthright citizenship. And ultimately, nothing of meaning was really accomplished in, in terms of, of immigration. Whereas what the Biden administration is doing, I mean, the only way to reverse this stuff uh, would be through force the most obvious example is uh, deportations, right? Like actually finding these people, rounding them up and deporting them, uh, which is actually much harder to do uh, for, for various reasons. But I, I think it's, immigration is really kind of illustrative of this, of this inc incongruity between how the right approaches things and how the left approaches them and how one side is more willing to use power and maybe abuse institutions to get what they want. Mm -hmm. And, I'm not really, I'm not a, I'm, I'm a social conservative, obviously, but I'm not a conservative in the sense that I believe that we need to kind of, we need to uh, play by uh, Queensbury rules mm -hmm. because this is what happens. Uh, you know, while we're all writing articles and doing interviews and focusing on stuff that's happening around the world, the Biden administration is just allowing an endless stream of ultimately new voters to enter the country. Yes, and I'm so glad you're bringing it back up because, uh, you know, oh, immigration is so 2016 or whatever, you know, that uh, we do get distracted by things going on abroad and they're important because they have a bearing on us, especially when we're paying for a lot of the stuff. But uh, yeah. yeah, I'm glad you're uh, bringing it back up again. And that's just going to be in Chronicles. You'll be writing that? Probably. Okay. Um my the, the next call I've got planned for Chronicles is actually going to be on the LGBT stuff and a dust up between um, the Republicans in Texas and the national log cabin Republican machine, which lost its fight uh, to intimidate some Texans and Republican to kind of do what they wanted. So that's that's good news uh, for the grassroots. And so eventually I'll be writing about immigration in Chronicles again. Yeah. Excellent. I didn't know about the log cabin um, hubbub, so I'll look forward to that. And then your transgenderism white paper, where is that going to be published again? Uh, through the American Principles Project, and I don't have a date on it, so okay. just hopefully in the near future. You'll share that through your newsletter mm -hmm. and Substack? Yep. Excellent. Right. Well, sir, you are uh, a gracious 
a gracious person. Uh, you have been so patient working with me over the past, I think it's been about a month we've been trying right. to put this together. And then we have to, you know, marry these two Zoom episodes together, but I will uh, do it seamlessly. And uh, I just thank you so much and wish you the best. And if you ever uh, need anything from me, I am there for you, sir. You're fighting the good fight, uh, confronting the smelly little orthodoxies of our time, which is what Tom Wolf said about Chronicles a gazillion years ago. And y'all are still doing it over there. And I just wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you.